So what, what are the most asked marketing questions that you're getting from the C-suite and board? Yeah, so I'm going to throw something up in a minute, but it, this is something I do each year. I, I, I weirdly, when I see so many people and I get asked, I don't know, maybe I'm a bit of a sucker that always gets asked at the end of each meeting. Now, can I just can I just pick your brains on something that we've got an issue with or we're thinking about? And I add those up each year and I figure out what are the 12 most asked questions I get. And some of them are quite old school in a good way. And some of them are very technology driven, as you can imagine, as the world changes quickly from a marketing point of view. So I'm going to quickly work through them and then we might just pick up one or two, Vanessa, if, and, and, uh, if we want. But let me just quickly share the screen. This is what I, I did in um, January, February this year as a, uh, as, a, as a way of highlighting it. So probably no surprise, but trust was the number one thing I got asked about. And you know, when we think about, you know, I think one of the KPMG reports we did had a phrase in there that said, you know, trust is one in, uh, one in drops and lost in buckets. It's a really big thing. People are saying to me off the back of the Royal Commission or two Royal Commissions and, and, and what's going on with consumers and particularly now off the back of COVID, you know, how do, how do we make sure we're building up trust? How do we make sure, you know, we, we, we're maintaining that brand trust with our, with our consumers? 5G is interesting. I think there's a few people thinking a couple of years ahead as to, you know, when, when 4G came in, it unlocked a lot of power for marketing. I think 5G, the amount of data that's going to be able to get processed in real time through our devices in our hands and through, you know, IoT devices in stores, beacons, et cetera, is going to be enormous. So people are starting to think about how do they unlock what's going to be possible um, uh, in those times. You know, 5G... I think it's around 2024 that they're expecting that peak to happen. So we're still a few years away, but, um, but planning for that. I don't think it's going to enable us to do too much that we haven't been able to already. The technology is there, but it's just the power of processing um, and, and real-time information that it's going to drive. Personalization is really important. Um, you know, one of the KPMG customer experience excellence reports that came out recently um, showed that in Australia, um, trust and personalization were the two biggest drivers of customer experience excellence. So people expect personalization. I often say that, um, you know, and obviously I'm chair of Australian pork, but I think butchers and our coffee shop owners are two of the best um, to CRM or, or, or customer marketers we get, you know, they, they recommend things. They see you coming and know what your coffee is. Uh, you know, they know what you had last week for dinner and they recommend you something else. So I think, you know, we expect that and, and people don't, disseminate they don't look at say Maya versus DJs anymore they look at Maya versus Apple or Maya versus you know an online experience they might have had through Amazon or, or even in a completely different category so th that expectation around personalization and, and and I say that's a digital and human interaction we often lean really heavily quickly to digital personalization without remembering that a lot of people just want to have um, a, a, a great personalized human experience as part of the customer journey digital media sort of it comes in and out. I think there's so much that's happening in digital media and programmatic and, and, and people are asking a lot of questions around, you know, how much of my digital media money is, is working or not working. So I'll, I'll come back to a bit of that in a minute, but, but certainly people are still unsure. You know, I think traditional media people have understood for quite a while. I think digital media continues to grow. New things arrive like a TikTok. Um, you know, there's certainly huge growth, even through all of, all of COVID and, and all of the issues that Facebook had, I think their advertising revenue is still up 11%. Uh, so, so it's not going away. We need to embrace it. AI is probably, um, you know, one of the next most asked things that I get. I, I think the ability to do so many different things with AI in, in our industry, uh, certainly, you know, we're seeing AI um, crunch uh, a lot of data uh, quite quickly. We're seeing AI in content come out quite, quite quickly you know i'm on the uh, on the board of the national basketball league and you know ai is driving a lot of the content in real time um there's there's some great technology that um we've accessed out of israel where it picks up a you can program it to basically post on social media every slam dunk uh, as soon as it happens so the slam dunk will happen the ai machine learning will know that it's happened it picks up the start of the play to the end of the play it puts it into a post. It even recognizes the player. It might say, you know, big dunk from Andrew Bogut from the Sydney Kings. It gets sent straight to the marketing team in real time who literally hit yes if they want to post it or they can edit it slightly and post it. So, you know, um, Hollywood is ingesting a lot of the movies um, uh, from the past and the trailers to figure out what, what trailers drove the best movie results. 
So right now, most of Hollywood, you know, it, it will tell you after you finish the movie that here's, here's the 10 scenes that need to go into the trailer. So there's all sorts of cool stuff. There's also personalized videos. We are talking before we jumped on the call. Um, you know, there's a great startup here in Australia called Smart Video who are doing over a million personalized videos a month for either onboarding um, new customers or onboarding new staff. Um, I think uh, companies like Woolworths and Toyota, I believe, uh, have used them in the past. So, you know, you buy a new car, it will say, hey, you know, thanks, Andrew. It was great to buy that new Toyota Hilux. Yeah, your nearest dealership to get your car serviced is down at Brookvale. So the whole 30 second video is tailored to you, which is pretty cool. Um, voice is, is uh, I think, is one of the most fascinating ones because, you know, hey, Google, hey, Siri, hey, Alexi. In the future, we're going to get one answer when we ask for something. Hey, you know, add, add milk to the shopping basket. Right now, it's still it still will ask you, it'll, it'll send a link back to your phone or, or your computer saying, here's the 10 options like a traditional page, but it's going to get to a point where it's just giving you one answer. And, and you're already seeing that, you know, Amazon, for example, are, there's a bit of niggle in the U S that all of a sudden the top six of the top six battery brands, it recommends five of them are their own. But so, so we've got some, you know, I think we're going to be marketing to AI for voice coming up 50% of search, in China, Indonesia, uh, India is being done by voice. In Australia, it's already 30%. So that's a big one. Um, and then quickly through the rest, the influencer marketing is just one I constantly get asked about because I think people just want to know whether it's working or not. And I think the answer is within, you know, I think the best campaigns and the most effective campaigns on have on average 10.2 channels that they work through. I think influencer can play a strong role within that. And there's some good data that shows that good influencer marketing is working. Obviously, through COVID, a lot of our travel bloggers haven't got much to do, but our fashion and beauty bloggers have never been busier. Um, data transparency, very important. My little nod here is to say that it's a bit like your, back, your neighbor with data. I think it, this is my layman's expression of what we should or shouldn't be doing with data. Um, if you know that the neighbor's kids have been crook and they're at home and, 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 and one of the parents is away, you might knock on the door and say, oh, here's a casserole or here's some soup. You know, With that data you've got, you're doing something good with it. Um, if you're spying through the back fence, trying to figure out what's going on, well, that's not quite the right use of data. So I think there's a, there's a, that builds back to trust. Marketing technology and what, what um, I suppose, what our marketing technology stack should or shouldn't be. There's, I think I saw a thing recently, I don't know if you've seen, there's a chart that shows all the marketing technology brands on one page. And in 2011, there was 110 of them. There's now 7,040 of them. I mean, the choice is just astronomical. Um, marketing mix, is a little leans back toward AI a bit, but people and boards in particular, this is one I get asked from boards. How do we know that say we've got $10 million to spend on marketing this year. How do we know we're optimally spending that across those say 10 channels? How much should we be spending in digital? How much should we be spending on brand short term versus long term? boards are looking for a lot more science in this. And there are, again, there's a great startup out of Melbourne um, called uh, mutiny. They've got a product called war chest that, that helps, do that marketing mix and media mix optimization. Creativity, thankfully, as someone who grew up in the advertising industry, first and foremost, uh, people are still asking for, for proof around the power of creativity. And there's so much data now from what the IPA has done in, uh, in, uh, in the UK and also what the comms council have recently done here. So I think that's something that it's a question, but I think we've got a lot more science behind it and it's easier to go back and, and, and really tout for why we should be using creativity more. The last one there is I call firm decisions and I, I've been sort of caught in betwixt and between of this. There's sort of four industries converging, right? There's your tech companies like your IBMs and your Accentures. Then there's the big four accounting firms who are starting to play into the marketing world. Then you've got your bigger six ad agency groups around the world and then the rest of the advertising industry. And then you've sort of got your consulting firms like McKinsey and Bain. So you've got four, four industries all converging on one market. And I think what CEOs and boards are asking me is, well, which one should we be looking for for advice nowadays? You know, in the old days for brand, you would only go to your advertising agency. Well, now you might go to one of those four. So the world's changing a bit around that. So there, that's them. I'll jump back out of the screen. I mean, I, you know, that's normally, a, we laugh, that's normally like a 40 minute presentation I've done in six. Um, but uh, that's, um, <laughs> that's, that just gives you a flavor of what I'm being asked about. Um, and, and I don't think too many of those you know, there's probably, there might be one or two that come in and come out off the back of COVID. But as I said, some are very traditional and some are very future focused and technology focused. 
Uh, that was a very condensed version, um, Billy, and I, I have a few questions and I do encourage um, everyone to, to add theirs as well through the Q&A box. But uh, when I look at that, you know, a large majority of them relate to digital or, or technology transformation. So I suppose a question to you is like, do you think it's getting easier to market in the digital work? Is it harder? Um, what are you seeing the impact of the digital transformation is having on the way people market and the way decisions are made? Yeah, if I put my consumer hat first and foremost on, it comes back to what's the right balance between that digital and human interaction uh, and, and that full customer journey because, you know, pe people might buy a, you know, buy a bottle of wine one day by just seeing something um, online and just going, that looks good and I'll buy it. And that's a complete online journey. And other time might be in a bottle shop and the vintage sellers or somewhere and actually asking for some advice and having that human interaction. So we, we have our different moments with whatever we're buying. So I think that's the first thing. I think the second thing is there is a lot of choice. Do due diligence. Often look at digital transformation building a house is my analogy for that. It's like, unless you get the architectural plans right up front, unless you do enough homework and enough discovery to figure out what you need and what you want to build. Um, the build then of the house becomes easier. If you don't do that and you get halfway through the build of the house and you say to the builder, oh, actually, I wouldn't mind changing that. And all of a sudden it's going to cost you a fortune to change it. I think building websites and digital infrastructure is a bit the same. You really want to do, you want to, you know, I, I encourage people to spend, you know, 25 to, you know, a quarter to a third of their budget up front, absolutely nailing what mm. that, what that roadmap for your digital transformation is going to look like, um, you know, what marketing technology you might need to put in there, um, you know, how to, how to build off the back of that, um, you know, what apps or other digital infrastructure you might need, get that right, uh, get those plans right up front. And, and, you know, again, like the house, if you think you might need a renovation two years in when you need to go up another floor, we'll build that in now so that it's much easier to put the other floor on your house um, than coming back in and, and pulling the roof off and having to do it all again. So, yeah, that's my, it's hard, right? There's so much choice. And, and, I, and I've been helping a few clients in the last 12 months do, you know, the, help them find the right partners for those digital transformation projects. And, and the choice is enormous. But once you've got that right, I think, um, yeah, it, it makes it a lot easier. And how well do you think businesses are going and getting that part right? Like how, you know, that, that's, you know, very clear advice and direction, but in the myriad of decisions and choices and uh, COVID as well, you know, how, how well are organisations planning and, and, you know, what does that mean in, in their success, do you think? Yeah, look, I think people do want to rush to the solution a lot quicker than they should. Um, so that is often the case. Um, having said that, I do think that COVID has pointed out that some of these solutions don't take anywhere near as long as you think they might. Um, and, you know, some of the technology we, we get, we get caught up very quickly in, you know, thinking this thing's going to cost a fortune. And I think you realize there's actually some really good solutions that are quite quick to implement. Um, yeah, particularly if you've got a decent setup to start with uh, that you can add on. So, you know, again, if you're building, you know, building things out digitally, I think you want to make sure that you're as, you know, you, you've got, you've got opportunities to add things in that you're not always having to go back to that organization and asking for them to change stuff. You want to have an ability to change it quickly yourself or use APIs to bring other information or other data in quickly. Yeah. I, yeah. Stay, stay, stay flexible. I think is, is, is what a lot of them are looking to do. And many businesses often cut marketing in a downturn. This the new leaks ward area i think there's a headline every day on that um you know would you warn against this and and how are you seeing businesses making most of their resources or even mm. in, in this time like what what are the trends and, and and what's your advice yeah there's been some quite public like during this downturn you know you've had people like pizza hut and png come out of the state saying that they're doubling down on marketing and then you've had people like coca-cola saying that they're pulling marketing spend and that's unusual for Coke. In most other downturns, they've actually doubled down on spend. I, I do get it this time around. I mean, with food services there, I, I mean, I would guess their most profitable sector. You know, when you go to a restaurant and you're paying $5 for a glass of Coke, um, you would guess that's where the margin is rather than, you know, um, buying you know, a, a can of Coke down at the supermarket for, you know, 80 cents. So, so, so with that came, I would say, came some margin squeeze. So I think it is a bit of horses for courses, but all the proof, 
from the previous four or five downturns, whether it's been GFCs or world wars or, 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 the, or the last recessions, um, has been that those that have invested in marketing, I think this is important, particularly when we talk to our finance friends within organizations, marketing should be seen as an investment, not a cost. And, and, and if we can out invest our competitors during this time, it has been proven that you'll come out the other side uh, stronger and with more market share. Uh, and sometimes that doesn't mean you're spending anywhere near because if all the other competitors have pulled their, their budgets back to nothing, you don't have to do too much to be outspending them. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've, we've seen this in the, um, in the, in the meat industry with my Australian pork hat on the, a lot of the other meats pulled back and we've continued, um, our regular spend. And all of a sudden we're, we're significantly, um, you know, winning share of voice in the market because, because of that. So, you know, out, out point or out invest is the key and that's just it's not just an advertising or a pr thing this is a you know this is a time to do r d really strongly there's this great example i think kindle was launched during the last gfc so amazon didn't stop and go i'll wait for it to all get over would we're going to continue with this link mini ipod and a few other apple products were launched in the in that you know um, to early 2000s crash so i think r d is really important if you're going to look at you know new product um, new services this is a really good time to spend to spend the time to do that and, it, and it's been proven that it works um but yeah there's there's a huge amount of information um the comms council just brought something out um uh in australia which talks about all the you know recession marketing so if people haven't seen that and i know vanessa and i've got a copy of that where we'd be happy to share it but uh, that's a great document that's got some real proof in there if you're trying to you know because one of the t tough things here is convincing <laughs> convincing senior leaders that they should be continuing to invest in marketing it's quite a good document to help with that Absolutely, and I think it demonstrates without a doubt over the last three to four downturns, the organisations that got what you're recommending right, which is actually the planning, the out investing, maintaining their share of voice, and then using that opportunity and that downtime to invest in research and development and innovation were the ones that, that came out on top. So we are going to ask our audience today what they think matters most to them. So this will take the form of a couple of polls. So the first one really, out of the 12 marketing matters, Matters that Billy's run through today, which matters to you right now. Um, so we'd love you to, to give your view on that and we'll report the results live. Um, while we're doing that, um, Billy, can you pull out any, any businesses you're seeing at the moment that are following that advice and, and doing things well or any that you would highlight? Um, yeah, look, I think um, there was a good article that Mark Ritson wrote a couple of weeks ago on NR NRMA and, and NRMA in this time of they sort of repurposed that the, the koala ad. They first repurposed it into a bushfire ad, and they, I mean, the brand is actually all about help. You know, in a way, they've they've leveraged. You know, this is a time that brands should, who are doing okay should be helping. So I think they had a really relevant opportunity. I think some brands that have tried a bit hard through this to help, and that hasn't been the part of the DNA of their brand. So. I'd encourage people if they can find that article to read it. It was a good snapshot of somebody. And, and, and most of the work's gone into brand, not into short-term buy insurance. And, and it seems like their, their, their metrics from a marketing point of view are going in the right direction. It's obviously still early days. Like, you know, we're, what are we? We're, we're, we're um, you know, we're six months into this. One of the interesting things I did discover as I did a lot of research in the COVID space is that there's a great piece of research from the UK from 2009 that talks about how long it takes for habits to form. And this research um, figured out that it's about 66 days. And if you think about, we were in lockdown for more than that the first time, you know, hopefully the, our friends in Melbourne aren't gonna be in lockdown for that, that long this time. But, it, you know, you think about some of the consumer habits and consumer behavior changes that have happened in, in that in 66 days. And I've often said to marketers during this time, do you want those habits to stick or, or not? Because if you don't, you need to start doing some marketing that halts that change um, as a marketer. So it is an interesting time as, as, we, as we go through this. And with NRMA, one of the things you mentioned there was what was touched on on the Communications Council report on marketing in a recession, which was getting the balance right between uh, we've just got our, our um, poll here, so I might run to that. So um, in terms of what our audience thinks matters most, we've got um, brand trust running at 52%, personalised customer experience at 26%, and firm decisions at another 26% as the most important things. What do you think of that? Does that surprise you at all? No, I think trust, as I said, it is the number one question I've been asked in the last two years. and and. Uh, obviously verified from 
from the KPMG research. We look at the Edelman Trust barometer that comes out each year, and, and that's always um, you know showcasing what needs to happen. I think um, you know we, we need to work really really hard on brand trust, particularly through these sorts of times. And yeah, that doesn't surprise me at all. And the, and the customer experience side doesn't surprise me. I think the the marketing mix also um, that is that is a big question I get asked, as I said specifically by boards. You know, and that's really an ROI conversation. And, and this, you know, which firms we turn to, it, it's a new, it's a newish issue, right? It's really only come about in the last two to five years. So that doesn't really surprise me either. Um, I guess yeah. looking at the other end of that, Paul, though, you've got influencer marketing um, not, not getting, gaining any traction. Um, <laughs> some of the digital elements like the launch of, of 5G, data transparency and um, artificial intelligence, I guess, lower down on the priorities. What do you make of that? Yeah, oh, look, I think, I, think the, that, I think the AI voice search type one is something we all need to have. A look at. I think there's a real push to you know, how do we automate as much of our marketing as we can to save a bit of money to invest back into other areas? So, so I do, and, and this voice search is coming quicker for those with kids who are teenagers like me. I mean, I just don't see them type anything into phones or devices. It's just all, hey, Google, hey, Siri, the entire time. So we've got to get used to that. You know, SEO and SEM off the back of that is going to be very different in the next five years. So we need to start thinking about what we need to change and how we, how we do marketing differently. But yeah, the trust piece, is you know and it's no i mean i've got about six or seven different talks i do on the on the speaking circuit and the brand trust one is the one i've done the most in the last two years so yeah no surprises well we're going to run that poll again this is uh, the question is what matters now and i guess the, the what we're interested in is you know um whether that changes if you look at what matters to you in the next five to ten years so for our audience that is the same question but i guess thinking out of today and into the future um is there any difference in in what's going to matter to you in the next five to ten years um while we're running that poll um billy i would like to ask if you could give one piece of advice to marketers at the moment what what would it be um i think it's it's something i've actually said for years about i think it's stay curious it's stay open-minded to what is out there. Um, you know, I think I've always seen marketing as a, it's a bit like a game that never ends marketing. Yeah. The minute you feel like you've solved the problem, something else happens that, that forces you to, to rethink a whole new solution. Again, it's like the jigsaw puzzle that never ends. And, uh, and so, so therefore the best marketers in any time, I think are those that just are inherently curious and ask lots of questions and um, are always reading and trying to learn and, and, and think about what's coming and, and, and really analyzing their market well. I think the ROI thing is really important too. Um, and that's, that's not gonna go away. You know, wh wh when we've got the squeeze on marketing budgets for the next couple of years, I think the ROI side of things and really understanding what's out there that can help you, um, you know, best, you know, position that marketing investment to your firm, I think is gonna play a big role too. Fantastic. And I think, as you say, the advice on staying curious and open-minded is, is perpetual advice. Um, what does that mean at the moment, though? Um, look, I, I think, I mean, I've, I've, I've got a Word document. I, I've been capturing every COVID article that's been interesting, for example, you know, from a marketing point of view from around the world. I, I don't know how many words it's got in that document, but I, that, that's one way I do. I mean, I, I subscribe to so many different... Um, uh, I suppose, you know, um, the newsletters or email daily things. And, and I tend to go through them at the start and the end of the day to have a look at what, what I might be able to add. So for me, it's, it's really understanding what the opportunities are off the back of COVID and how, how the better brands around the world. There's a lot of really good stuff from China because China is eight to 10 weeks ahead of us in this pandemic. And there's a, there's a lot to learn, particularly in, for those that might be retailers. There's some really good examples of what brands have done well from that point of view. So yeah, it's uh, yeah, that that's that that's the curiosity, just staying ahead of the game, I think, and and reading stuff that's outside of your comfort zone or is is the norm. I mean, you know, I've got a lot of good friends who've been involved in the ad news and umbrellas and B and Ts over the years, but I but I there's so many, um, you know, and that's great in telling us what's happening today in our industry here, but there's so many other great things you can subscribe to around the world.
Fantastic. Um, very good advice. So, this, I mean, this is interesting. So, the, the brand trust day is pretty high, but I guess what matters most in the next five to 10 years to our audience is quite different. So, personalised customer experience has come out on top, as well as some of the areas that were probably less important, digital media and marketing technology, artificial intelligence and voice search certainly rates as our next thing on the to-do list um, there. So, so, what does that mean? I guess the short term versus the long term. Yeah, well, I think um, I think people are really. I think I think it's a real challenge about what what great customer experiences are going to look like over the next little while, and that does play into the next two around digital and marketing technology. What technology do we need to have to do that? Um, and and I think you know what what role can AI and voice play to to help us to drive efficiencies, to drive speed. Uh, I think I think in a weird, in a way the three of them are almost tied tied together a little bit. Um, so yeah. And how do you explain the different response? I guess in what's on people's minds right now, which is more around I guess brand trust and um, you know making firm decisions and and some of the immediate things versus what's on our minds for the longer term. How do you explain that difference? Yeah, look, I think I think when there when it, when there is a downturn, I think trust is always heightened. I think it was a big thing in this market, particularly anyway, for the last couple of years, because of, as I said, those two Royal commissions and, and a lot of pressure from the media on certain brands for certain things. So, you know, I, I just think that's something that's been top of mind for marketers for a couple of years and, and people are still grappling with it a little bit. Um, there's some good frameworks that I've found, which happy to share with the group later around brand trust. There's four, normally when I do my brand trust talks, there's sort of four frameworks I've found that are quite easy ones to work through from a brand trust point of view for your organization. Um, so yeah, so that, yeah, that's not surprising, but yeah, the, the, the technology one is, is tough. As I said before, there's so much choice in, in, in the technology side. Fantastic. Well, I am going to move to um, questions. We've got some really great questions here um, from our audience. Please put them in the Q&A box and um, we'll spend the, 15, the next 15 minutes getting through as many as we can. Um, so thank you to Petra who's asked, do you think the trends are still changing or has um, data transformation moved to the max? So, you know, I suppose the question there is, you know, have we seen, you know, we've got to catch up with the change or do you think things are still changing? What does that mean? Yeah, I think I think on the data side, and that's why I'm quite interested in the 5G, I think we're going to have, you know, we've got so much data now, we're going to have, you know, I think the, it's, it's, it's going to be the ability to put between 100 and 1,000 times more data to be crunched and transferred, you know, when, when 5G hits and we've got our devices in our hands. So I still think there's quite a bit to go on data. I think it's, it's, it's an imperative to get, you know, get your data sorted now. And I think the way we're doing data has changed as well, like I think three or four years ago, we we're talking about how do we build giant data lakes to access all our data. And now we're more talking about, well, there's so many of these marketing technology companies that can, you know, use APIs to drag all our data into one place and, and, and push it back out from a personalization point of view. So I do think, you know, the, the way the way we're doing um, and thinking about data is, is still moving. Um, yeah. Fantastic, great summary. Um, probably a question on everyone's mind at the moment. If you want an increased marketing budget at the moment, what's the best way to pitch this? To <laughs> yeah, I think just quietly send that communications council document to your boss. I think that would uh, yep. that would help. Uh, look, I, there, there's, and look, I think we've all tried to fight the good fight. I think I've written a couple of articles on it. Um, Mark Ritson's Mark certainly written a number of articles on this. Um, Peter Field out of the UK. I mean, I think you know we're all trying to say we've been through this once or twice before and the proof is there i think you know people are looking for proof and, and if you can show that you know investing in marketing at this time uh work has worked in the past you know i, I said i it certainly you know now that i sit on a number of boards and you had marketing teams coming to me in a sense i was being the client on a couple of these things you, you had to stand by your your beliefs so uh, Look, yeah, that's it's find the proof. I've had quite a few people write to me and say, "Can you send me hot links to a lot of those, you know, those those original um, sorts of, uh, you know, documents and researches and all that sort of stuff?" And there's plenty of that around. But that the Communications Council document that's been recently launched has got a lot of that good information in it. So I think that's uh, yeah, okay. it's a t it's an uphill battle because it's a finance versus versus marketing yeah. dilemma. 
No, it's really, um, yes, the, 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 we will share the Communications Council document. I guess it, effectively it gives a lot of the data around companies that performed well and not so well in the last um, downturns going right back to, you know, the GSC in the early 90s and it's fairly empirical. Um, it's also Australian data and does show that those that invested in, in marketing and brand and activation during the downturns did come out um, on top. So that's fabulous data for everyone trying to build a business case. And then, um, you know, what you're saying, Billy, too, is, is having your own information and, and data to be able to demonstrate that value is a, a great start as well. Yeah. Um, another great question here. Hi, Andrew. Leads generated through search marketing have taken a lot longer to convert during COVID. With consumer spend becoming cautious, are we better off focusing on brand awareness over lead generation campaigns? Yeah, I think I've heard that from a couple of people that, um, uh, you know, a couple of marketers that that uh, SEO hasn't been as strong. Um, uh, that NRMA case study is interesting because it, it did, uh, whilst they didn't specifically mention search, they certainly did say that what they doled up was was brand um, brand awareness and, and a brand campaign. So, and again, some of the research from the past showcase shows that that is is the case. So, yeah, I mean, I think from a media point of view, it's interesting because we we have never, you know, um, if I go back to a media paid media rather than um, you know we're just talking about search then, but you know we, we're we're up I think ten percent viewership on TV. We're up on readership in newspapers, uh, online news. Um, are up, you know, 20 plus percent. Obviously, some of our outdoor um, is down because we haven't had the traffic going past it. So I think all media channels, including SEO, SEM, are going to, you know, uh, will we'll, in, in these sorts of um, crisis periods are going to change quite rapidly. And, and I think as marketers, we need to be making sure we understand what those changes are and making sure that we're we're shifting and shuffling budgets to where, you know, the better ROI and the better outcomes are. Fantastic. Um, we've got. Around 10 more minutes and um, we do have only one more question. So if anyone have any for Billy while we have him here, please put them in. Um, great question here, I guess, while there's been a fair bit of discussion around funding of university courses and what that means. The question is, what more can universities do to get marketing graduates ready for the workplace? Yeah, this is something that's dear to my heart. I mean, I was chair of Deakin Business School for four years and now I'm an adjunct professor at Sydney Uni and my role at Sydney is, is an industry engagement role. So it really is about making sure that the academics and in marketing and in, 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 in an industry that's changing rapidly, as we all know, that we, we are teaching and researching, um, you know, in, in, the, in the best possible way. And I think, you know, the, the, the universities still have a role to make sure that we're delivering the fundamentals as part of the education. You know, I think the, the, the absolute minimum that, that students and graduates should have as they come out of university is, is to have that really strong underpinning um, of the foundations of, of marketing. But, you know, we are executing marketing very, very differently <laughs> as the years go on. And, and I think um, that's what I'm trying to make sure. I mean, Sydney Uni, for example, have put a capstone unit in as the final subject. And, and it has, it's a, I think it's an 11 week um, um, unit and it has 11, um, it has 11 uh, industry experts coming in. So it, it, it really is a stepping stone subject into the real world um there's a real there's two i think it's think two or three real briefs that come into that um, um so so effectively they're being lectured by industry people for the whole for their last subject and i think that sort of transition is a lot stronger than probably what it has been in the past where you know uh, even me as a ceo back in my publicist and ogilvy days would often tell you know we, we sort of have to retrain them as soon as they get here and that's the last thing that universities want to hear so so i think you know, giving them the feedback, um, you know, I had a long discussion um, with my Sydney uni hat on just uh, just before the last school holidays, just around um, one of the pieces of the curriculum um, that, that they have an opportunity to change up. And, and normally, you know, at most universities, most of the subjects get re-looked at every three or four years. So there is an opportunity to, to make some of those changes. And I think if we're feeling strongly about it, we should be reaching out, particularly if we're, most of us are alumni from somewhere, uh, that they would love to get that help. But I think, the unis, what I've learned over the years, they feel like that uh, the senior people won't talk to them. Um, what I've found is the senior people are the most likely to talk to them. They want to give a bit back. Um, they, they feel like that. I think, I think it's the, the, more the junior and the, uh, the middle level people that are really busy and scrambling and, and running around that, that don't quite know how they can play that. So I, 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 there's not many people I've asked to help at either Sydney or Deakin in the past six or seven years that have said no at a senior level because they really do want to give back and help. 
So I guess your advice to universities is keep focusing on that stronger links between industry and the courses and, and yes. so you can build those relationships and, you know, I guess um, connect the, the theory to the practice. Yeah, and it's a key part of their ranking system. One of the key things is industry engagement. And, and, and um, so, you know, you see all the universities get rankings at, you know, number whatever in the world. It's, it's, one, it's one of the things they have to tick a box on, which say, so why shouldn't we all be trying to help them do that? Yeah. All right, we've got a couple of a uh, couple more great questions um, here. We've got a question um, around, I guess, new entries to the marketing sector. So mergers, entry of accounting firms into the marketing sector. Um, do you think that the market's going to get oversupplied um, with services, or do you think that new entrants will become a force for a more disciplined approach to marketing? So you touched on that before in the mergers and the blending of all the disciplines and, you know, we're looking at data and technology and below and above the line content creation um, and lots of specialists in those areas. So I guess the question is, is that going to, you know, make it broader and, and more challenging or is it going to really force marketing in Australia to, to get very focused? Yeah. On there's there's sort of three strategies that most of the firms are taking and I'm going to quickly because I can throw this up here I'm going to share something quickly um, because uh, it's part of my longer deck on this and it's sitting here on my computer so this is my take um, for those that can quickly see it on so there really are as I said tech firms accounting firms agency firms and and and, and consulting firms they're color coded because they're playing different strategies so that the tech companies and the agency firms are playing one strategy the consulting firms and the accounting firms are playing another um, the agency and tech it's really about creative media and digital when you break it all down and it's becoming more and more executional um, in that and uh, and that's not a bad thing I think it's a it's a business model that can work but the answer is always going to be in one of those three buckets and, and that's not always <laughs> going to be the case I think if I jump to what the consulting and accounting companies are doing, they're more asking questions around the problems. You know, well, have you got any issues with any of your brands? How can we help? You know, any more information you need to find out about your customer? How can we help there? Um, or any issues with the marketing department? Is there anything we can, you know, come in and help help the marketing team with? So it's more of a, it's probably certainly less from a, you know, the business model point of view, less revenue, but higher margin. I mm -hmm. think the S4 type model is about automating the first model. You know, it's content, programmatic, AI, tech, data, um, you know, really, really focus on the digital side of, of, um, of this, you know, creative media and, and, and digital side of things. So, so they're the sort of the three things that are playing out. There's no right or wrong answer. I think that, that they all have a role at various um, points in time, but, you know, is it being oversupplied? Uh, I don't think so because certainly, you know, most firms are still up until COVID were still growing um in across all those sectors uh but you know it will be interesting off the back of COVID to see if there's longer term change in the industry fantastic um so we do have a, another question um great insights on the the current trends um today what, what advice um would you give those trying to market themselves in the industry at the moment and it's yeah. probably also um, raises a question um, with your connection with contract Andrew as well like you know where are the skills sitting and how are organizations going about harnessing those skills and I guess what does that mean um, for marketing experts um, in terms of how they should be positioning themselves yeah I think I I learned something many many years ago from a couple of my journalist mates who you know occasionally they might have gone from say news to Fairfax or vice versa and and a lot of their own personal content they'd written, you know, had obviously ended up sitting on the competitor's platform. <laughs> and, and so it was, it was something that struck you know, with me that, you know, whilst I didn't change, you know, role, I think I only really worked for three or four firms in 30 years, but when you left and went to another firm, you wanted to make sure whatever content you'd created around your personal brand went with you. So that's when I sort of set up my own, um, my, uh, my certainly my own um, you know website and a few other things that could capture all of that and uh, and you're certainly seeing journalists and you know musicians and actors and all sorts of people like that doing that now um, around personal branding I do think also clearly the trend the trend is towards a more contingent workforce um, and a variable workforce from a client point of view as we come out of COVID and on the other hand I think a lot of us actually quite like the freedom of being our own boss and and having our own business and and uh, and and you know doing consulting advising freelancing 
which is obviously also playing into the contract model, which, uh, which, which we know. So, you know, I think therefore, you know, making sure that you're slowly but surely, I don't, I don't think you need to go out there and do too many things. Like someone asked me the other week, why, how did I end up being one of the top 40 influencers or one of those power profiles on, on LinkedIn a few years ago? And I said, in that year, I only posted 20 times. So it wasn't about quantity. <laughs> it's often about just making sure you're pushing out, you know, quality. And that I, I, usually I was just republishing the articles I was writing for the Australian. So, so I don't think, you know, pushing your personal brand doesn't have to be something that you're doing every second of the day. It just needs to be a consistent um, theme that you're building up over time so that if you do decide to sit on that more consulting, advising, freelance side of the industry at one point in your career, you've got the opportunity and your, your base is built. Hopefully that makes sense. Fantastic. And, and from an employer perspective, what are you seeing in trends in, in I guess, building those marketing functions? Are they, you know, a mix of, of um, full time and, and contingent workforces or what do you see working well? Yeah, I think I think we are seeing, you know, headcount pressure, um, uh, particularly in marketing and, and other areas. And, and therefore, you know, one of the ways around that is is contingent workforce, you know, is, is to work with um you know, whether it be consulting firms or agency firms or businesses like Comtract to, to help help augment those teams. And specifically, if you, if you only need people coming in for a certain thing for, you know, two, three, four weeks, I think that's going to be the big piece about, you know, what, what's your, you know, how many generalists do you need in there um, to, to keep the core offering going and making sure that we're doing really strong work, particularly around the marketing side? And then how can we augment that? Um, every so often when we have a specific project or an event or a need that pops up. I, I think that's going to be more the model going forward. Uh, and, um, you know, and I, and I think even sitting within agencies, that's going to be more and more of the model. And, and we've seen extremes of that in the past, you know, agencies like Host went down that path many years ago, probably then got stuck back in a more traditional route in more recent times. But, but yeah, I, I do think there's, there's clearly opportunity on, on both sides of that marketplace. Um, a need from what clients are looking for and businesses are looking for and a need from, I think, the life many of us want to lead. Fantastic. Well, we have um, covered a, a large amount of ground today, so thank you so much for your time. I would like to thank everyone for being able to join us. There were some extra, extra questions and um, we will review those and, and share some additional information, um, including those reports that we mentioned. So, uh, Billy, thank you so much for your time and your insights. We really appreciate it. No worries. It. And thank you for having me. And, I, and I've seen a lot of familiar names on the list on the right-hand side. So hi to all of you. Um, so good. Thank you for joining us. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Thanks, guys.